So it's so good to have all you beautiful people here today uh, to spend the morning with me. Thank you for taking time out of your, your busy time. You know, we, we've come together to talk about how to support individuals on the autism spectrum to reach their employment goals. And so to that end, I would just like to start by telling you a story of two very different children from two very different parts of the world whose paths crossed in a very unusual way when they grew up. And bear with me, um, it does have to do with employment, so just stick with me as I tell the story. When Denise was 18 months, her mother bought her a paint set, hoping to see all those bright splashes of color everywhere that kids paint on paper. But Denise was not interested in color. She liked black spots. As a matter of fact, she was obsessed with them. She was so obsessed that that's all she would paint. And her mother, of course, was very worried that perhaps she did something um, to damage her daughter that all she would do is paint black spots. Um, she was quite relieved at some point when she turned five that she was actually willing to paint rainbows and butterflies in lieu of those black spots. But unbeknownst to her parents, learning how to color in her drawings was the least of this little girl's challenges. In 1978, in one day, as the Denver snow had melted into puddles and the, at the corner of the street, where this girl stood watching the other first and second graders jaywalk to get to the other side. She, cried, she had already cried as her mother tried to make the seams in her socks and the tags in her shirt more bearable, but they had cut into her skin like blades. And so she stood already tired from her morning ritual and wondered if she could make the jump without soaking her feet. Her mother had told her to cross only at this corner. So the thought didn't occur to her that she could make an exception and follow the other children around the puddle. Nor did she think to walk the 500 feet back to her house to ask for help. So finally, worried that she was going to be late, she jumped and landed in the water. The little girl then spent the day with wet shoes and socks because she did not realize she could tell someone her feet were soaked. So no one ever knew. In high school, to avoid the lights, sounds, and especially the other students in the cafeteria, she would sneak into an empty classroom to read an encyclopedia or work on homework during lunch. She joined the drama club and speech team where she could study how people behaved. She realized at that time that other people do this thing called making eye contact. She watched people's mouths instead because eye contact was too painful. She spent hours rehearsing in her mind what to say to other people, sometimes late into the night. The girl grew up. She became a respected professional, but behind closed doors, she struggled to complete tasks that other people did with ease. Things like brushing her teeth, getting dressed, shopping for food, and joining colleagues for lunch. She was trapped in a cycle of abusive relationships, and she contemplated suicide. Sometimes she banged her head against the wall or bit her hands to ease the emotional pain. She felt guilty and wondered what could possibly be wrong as she burnt out from work every three to four years to the point that she was unable to work, sometimes for years at a time. Years later, her daughter was diagnosed with ASD or autism. So in her 40s, this woman met with someone who specialized in evaluating females on the spectrum and was told that she too is on the autism spectrum. Now, while Denise's parents were worried that something was wrong with her when she was very young, Arthur's parents thought they had a genius on their hands because at 18 months, he had taught himself to read. But as Arthur grew up, he had increasing problems in school and with behaviors. He had no filter on what he would tell people and it got him into quite a bit of trouble. His parents took him to a doctor and he was quickly diagnosed with autism. The doctor who evaluated Arthur told his parents they should put him in an institution and forget about him because he would never have the capacity to take care of his basic needs, let alone work or fit into society. Arthur's parents ignored this advice, but his mother soon realized that public school was not going to work with him, so she pulled him out and homeschooled him instead. Eventually, Arthur and his family agreed that it was time for him to move out on his own. So with the support from his family and staff, he moved into his own place where his family and staff still offered him help with budgeting, 
socializing, employment, and other important skills. Now, if you talk with Arthur today, he will tell you he never forgot the sting of hearing the doctor tell his parents that he did not have the capacity to learn. And that brings us up to today and how these two very different lives intersected. If you don't know me, and you might be surprised to discover that I was that little girl who was obsessed with spots. Denise is the name my parents call me. And Arthur, who I realized is exceptionally detail-oriented and straightforward, became the editor for my first book. Now, what happened in our case is that we took the very characteristics that other people thought were unacceptable when we were children, and we harnessed them to work for us. In my case, I didn't stop being obsessive. I just transferred my obsessions to, uh, from black spots to my obsession with autism. And now people pay me to, uh, for my obsession. And Arthur's lack of filter, though it has gotten him in trouble at times, was exactly what I needed to get the necessary honest feedback to make my book better than I could have done on my own. So those of you who are here today didn't choose to work for vocational rehabilitation to get rich. What you did do is choose a career that can have a positive lifelong impact on many people in ways that you may never ever fully realize. And I didn't share this part of my story um, just as a confession to you all. It's because employment has really significant links to a person's mental health. And I hear this all the time from my clients. We know that autistic people have shortened lifespans and they're more likely to be depressed. They're more likely to commit suicide. So it's not just about a job that we're talking about here today. We're talking about making a difference that can improve a person's quality of life to the point of preventing those types of things. So our goal for this time as we spend it together for the next two hours is to give you some actionable tools and insights to help you improve employment outcomes for your clients who are on the autism spectrum. And I'm gonna pull up a screen share and give you guys some slides to look at. All right. Yes. So the way that we're going to work on focusing on improving outcomes for our folks is we're going to break the training up into three separate parts. We're going to talk about autism and how it actually impacts the job search and job retention. I'm going to work with you on some autism friendly communication strategies. And then we're going to have a discussion about some of your particular situations that you've either dealt with in the past or ones that you're dealing with now that might be challenging and brainstorm on some of those issues so that we can look at how we could implement some of the things we're talking about today. So let's talk a little bit first about um, what autism is. And um, I'd like a little bit of feedback um, from you guys. What um, you know, either in the chat or if you can raise your hand and Solanda will help you um, participate. What is autism? What do you guys, you know, know about it? You've, you've worked with folks on the spectrum, you know, you know a thing or two. Yes, it's a developmental disability. Mm -hmm. How does it affect people? Sumter Area Office. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, it, it generally affects individuals in the area of um, development. They don't, they don't meet the milestones that generally match their uh, chronological age. Um, socialization skills are generally, um, generally behind. And they have um, very, very extreme sensitivity to external stimuli. Uh, lights, sounds, um, taste, and smells to the point that they find that they're, they find um, self-stimulating behaviors that kind of allow them to deal with the stimuli around them um, to help them to kind of cope. Um, sometimes you'll see repetitive behaviors. Uh, sometimes you'll see obsession um, that'll help them to kind of cope. Um, 
there are various, um, you can see individuals all over the, um, all over the spectrum. Um, not all of them have um, uh, speech impediments or, or, or speech delays. Not all of them are, you'll have some that are very extroverted, some are very introverted, um, but there's, you're still gonna have that socialization that's not, um, they're not able to pick up on those social cues. You, you guys are experts. So some of the other things I see in the comments are, it can affect learning abilities as well as the social interactions. Um, as Montgomery said, it can vary from person to person. And I think that's really important. One of the challenges you guys have in your work is that you can't just do a one size fits all. Things have to be really individualized because of this. Um, and so, yeah, so hopefully today I'm going to put my sh uh, slide share back on and hopefully we'll, we'll dig in a little bit deeper to help give you some more insight than just this, um, you know, this basic understanding that you guys really um, have a good insight on. So, so we're going to look at two different models of autism today. The one that you guys shared um, with the group is known as the medical model, and that is, of course, based on um, deficits. And we have this, it's a really helpful um, model for us because that's how your, the folks that you serve actually get eligibility to get your services or other people's services. And um, so the, the technical definition is that yes, it's a social communication disorder and it's characterized by ongoing problems with social emotional reciprocity, social nonverbal communication, developing and maintaining and understanding relationships. And what that looks like, you know, in the job um, site is you're going to have people who really do have significant issues often with their colleagues or with their bosses. Um, and it's, um, it's going to affect the ability to actually, um, for people to actually um, get their jobs as well. And that's why you're here. So, and that also plays out in terms of restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and or activities, which you guys did a really good job of describing. So that being said, there's another model called the neurodiversity model. And that takes away the deficit um, concept. And the neurodiversity model is the idea that people are wired differently and therefore they have a different and valid method of relating and communicating with each other and that they interact with and interpret their environments differently. So those things that we look at from the medical model as being problems, the neurodiversity model actually looks at them as strengths. And I wanted to share this particular model with you guys today, because as you are working to um, get people through the system and employed, um, this is a really useful tool or a way of looking at things in order to help, you know, find what people's strengths are and use those for the employment process. So I wanted to share with you, um, this is actually something called the ASPE quiz. And just to, you know, break down the neurodiversity model um, in a little bit uh, different visual way, um, this is taken from rdos.net. And you can all go online and take this quiz for, uh, you know, for free. It's about a um, hundred questions that they will ask you. And this, as you can see, is um, a little quadrant and there's a black line in the middle and you see um, that it's broken up into four uh, different areas. You've got um, on the right side, you have ASPE or, you know, autistic characteristics. And on the left side, you have neurotypical characteristics. And this shows that there are autistic types of talents, perception, communication, relationships, and social interactions. And then there are neurotypical or non-autistic ways of interacting. And so depending on how you respond to those questions, um, it will show whether or not you, you, know, you have neurotypical um, kinds of talents or autistic sorts of talents. And as you can see, this is, um, this is my ASPE quiz that I've taken recently. Um, and I've, I've taken this throughout the years and it always looks real similar to this, but um, I tend to have um, more autistic type talents. 
Uh, but you'll notice that my communication is even between uh, how um, autistic people and non-autistic people communicate. So I just think this is a really useful um, kind of way to see that while we are looking at deficits in order to access supports for people, as you are looking towards getting them into employment, this is a really good model uh, to utilize to that end. So as you guys know, um, there are a lot of benefits to hiring autistic employees. If you've got a person in the right job with the right supports, they're going to be very loyal and honest. You know, um, we don't have issues with autistic people typically stealing the toilet paper or clocking out early and pretending they're at work when they're not. Um, there's a lot of integrity that we find with people on the spectrum. Uh, they can be very highly skilled in whatever area that they choose to, um, to focus on. They'll have good attendance and punctuality if it's a good fitting job. I know that you guys um, deal a lot with uh, people who are struggling with this, but once things get into place and a person is settled in a, in a job that's a good fit, they will, um, actually the research shows people with developmental disabilities are less likely to show up late and they're less likely to call in sick than uh, people who are, um, um, you know, don't have developmental disabilities. So, um, and they often are willing to do tasks that other people just don't want to do or are unable to do. Um, that happens often. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, the general characteristics of autism, but I want to break this down a little bit more in detail for you guys to see how it shows up because we're dealing here specifically um, with adults and these people are gonna have all sorts of variety in their skills and abilities. And so some of the areas where we're gonna see this show up in social reciprocity, which you'll remember is the first part of the uh, definition of autism, is that they can be hyperverbal and or they can have limited expressive and receptive communication. And one thing I want you guys to keep in mind as you are working with folks on the spectrum is that just because a person is very, very verbal does not mean that they don't need support in communication. Uh, just to give you an example from my own life um, is that I still have trouble asking for help when I need it. And that's, even though I've been working with folks on the spectrum for years, I have um, really struggled with, uh, you know, knowing when to ask for help. It, the, the thought just doesn't occur in my brain to, to do this. And because I tend to be hyperverbal, no one would assume that I have communication struggles today, but I do. So keep that in mind as you're working with those folks who are real chatty or seem to have, you know, really good vocabulary or um, seem to communicate effectively. They will still, by virtue of, you know, having the diagnosis, have communication challenges. And then, of course, you know those folks that you mentioned earlier who do have limited expressive um, language. Um, some folks are going to be selectively mute, um, being able to talk sometimes and then um, at other times they will um, not speak at all. One of the things that we find, so you've got expressive communication, that's how I express to you, that's how I'm telling you um, what I need to say. And then of course the receptive communication is listening to what other people have to say and understanding. And Oftentimes what we get, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the training, is that uh, folks on the spectrum, just to stay under the radar and out of trouble, will um, pretend to understand more than they really do. So that's something to keep in mind as you're assessing and going through the process of eligibility and getting people in through the system, that um, a lot of times they will act like they are um, more aware than they really are. And we'll talk about some strategies later about how to address this. And of course, I, I think you've all probably seen those folks who are brutally honest. Um, and this shows up both in the job um, site as a challenge and also for the job search. One thing that I deal with um, when working with folks on the spectrum uh, to get them employed is they really underplay their skills. 
And if they're writing a cover letter or we're doing interviews or we're doing a resume, they're really often hesitant to um, expand on their skills because they don't, uh, they want to be completely honest and they feel that if they say, hey, I'm great at multitasking uh, or whatever it is, then that's going to be perceived as um, not being honest. So they always want to present the other side. And that that's a real challenge to get um, folks to sell themselves well. Um, in relationships, you know, this is, you know, this is the person who's going to tell their boss that the idea was stupid or that they are wearing an ugly shirt today. And um, so this is, um, you know, how it shows up in the workforce. You know, another thing that we see is that folks on the spectrum, the way our brains are wired is that we have a really difficult time uh, starting, stopping, and changing gears. So um, once a person gets started on something, it's, it's really hard to stop until that task is completed. And it can actually uh, cause a lot of anxiety if you expect them to, you know, to shift gears or stop something once, once you've started. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways this shows up in terms of like, if a person's been given a task and then they're expected to shift gears and, you know, switch over to a different task. But a lot of times you'll also see that a person, uh, is, is not starting something that they've been told to do. And this can have to do with, um, a longer kind of ramp up time that folks on the spectrum take in order to get started. So people are going to need to have a lot more time to get started um, on the spectrum traditionally than a non-autistic person. So another thing we see, of course, is that we like to focus on our special interests. And so if somebody's into coniferous trees or plastic bags or vacuum cleaners, that might be all they're going to be willing to talk about. Um, and they may, you know, show noticeable disinterest if other topics are addressed or if they're expected to focus on something that's not within the realm of their special interest. So in terms of nonverbal communication, of course, folks on the spectrum have a really hard time often reading facial expressions and body language. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about why that is. Um, one of the reasons is that the sensory issues that people have translate to um, people. We can have a lot of sensory issues around actually the human body. There's a lot of information going on in a face. And so it can, it can be painful to actually attend to a person's face or body. Um, likewise, we can have a lot of difficulty if there's more than one person because all of the movement um, between multiple people can also be overwhelming. So that's one of the reasons uh, that we have issues reading facial expressions and body language because it's just painful to look. Um, some of us have something called face blindness. And I've you know noticed that actually people on the spectrum have a larger likelihood of having face blindness than you know the average population. And um, so you may, you know, see somebody one time and then not recognize them the next. So you can imagine how um, upsetting or terrifying that is to never know, you know, who you're seeing. Um, you know, so you may not recognize your boss or your colleagues um, or the person, your job coach, the person who's evaluating you, your job counselor. Um, they may feel like they're a new person every time. Alexithymia is another issue um, that we have. That is a, a processing delay or a difficulty understanding or relating to emotions. And a lot of times it takes longer to process emotions or um, folks on the spectrum may not really be aware of how they're feeling. Um, it's really hard if you don't have awareness of how you're feeling then to um, have awareness of how other people are feeling. And then lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about empathy. It, you know, back years ago, 30 years ago, when I started uh, working with folks on the spectrum, I, I was told that folks on the spectrum uh, don't have any empathy. 
And as I worked with people, it became very clear to me that um, it's more common that people on the spectrum have extreme empathy. They're very, very affected by other people's emotions. And if something um, upsetting or bad happens to someone else, um, that's very disturbing and upsetting and they feel it very deeply. So oftentimes uh, a person's very empathetic and feels so much pain, like if, you know, somebody else, um, you know, feels sick or if somebody's family member dies or something like that, um, the, the autistic colleague uh, might feel very, very um, deeply upset about something that happens to someone else. So that's important to keep in mind. So, and of course, as you know, a lot of times an autistic person's facial expressions and body language just don't match their own thoughts and feelings. And sometimes that can happen by a person um, over-exaggerating, like having really happy um, extreme expressions or really you know, dramatically sad expressions um, that seem kind of theatrical and out of place. Um, and other times, uh, some folks on the spectrum can just seem really flat and you can't read anything and they just seem always kind of irritated or mad. And oftentimes folks on the spectrum will come to me and say, people think I'm mad all the time and I'm not feeling mad. It's just, you know, that's the image I, I give across. Um, that's a common issue. And you, you know, you know, this is a pretty significant issue if um, you're in the workforce and people think you're mad all the time. So. Folks on the spectrum in terms of body language um, may stand too close or too uh, far away from people. They don't have a, a, we don't have a good sense of um, judging how far um, away we should be from other people. And that can cause real issues of people uh, being, you know, having discomfort. I'm, you know, in the process right now of in another state working on a court case with a, an autistic man who, um, people were really upset with his, you know, his body language and felt he was being aggressive and um, kind of creepy. And it was just, he didn't have a sense of what his body language is in terms of his, how close he should be to other people or how far away he should be. So one of the other things that we see, there's a lot of conversation right now in the autistic community and um, people are looking at something called masking. Basically what that is, is that if you're on the spectrum, regardless of you know, what your functioning level is, what your skills are, your strengths, your areas of weakness, you're gonna pretend to fit in because when you don't, when you're just you and you're on the spectrum, that causes um, people to pay attention and it can get you into trouble um, a lot. And so we do something called masking and that is we observe the people around us to the best of our ability and we fake it and we pretend to be like other people. And um, this can be in terms of, um, you know, watching what, how other people hold their posture, how other people are um, communicating and um, how other people are interacting in the world. And this is very exhausting because it would be like you're um, playing a role all the time that you're an actor and you're not really being able to be you. And it, it's interesting because I find, you know, um, highly verbal autistic folks talk about this a lot but I see this with folks who have more limited um, cognitive abilities as well as limited language ability as well. Um, I see that they mask um, in their situations as well. And what that leads to um, is, is burnout. Um, you know, I mentioned in our introduction, the story about, you know, my life. Um, what you will often find is that most people on the spectrum really do want to please other people. Um, they want to do their best. And so they will put 150% energy into fitting in and doing what they need to do. But given all of the challenges with communication and sensory issues and anxiety, um, this leads to burnout. And autistic burnout is 
it's not like you feel burnout for a few days. Um, we see this actually um, affecting people over extended periods of time, six months to a year, a year and a half, two years. Some people can end up having burnout for real extended periods of time. So I just want you guys you know, to be aware of that because when we have ex expectations of people, it, it might seem like it's just a little thing um, you know, to most people but um, an expectation that appears little to someone else may be really a big thing and create quite a toll on someone who's on the spectrum. So burnout is definitely something to watch for um, and prevent. So, you know, autism, it's an in invisible disability. You can't necessarily look at someone and say, oh, that person is autistic. Sometimes you can, um, but in a lot of cases you can't. And a person's, you know, deficits or areas where they struggle are not, you know, they're not, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, everybody knows you have difficulty walking. If you wear glasses, everybody knows you have difficulty seeing, but these are, these are areas, um, of deficit that are not outwardly noticeable. So something else we see is that folks on the spectrum are taught compliance from an early age. Um, and so a big issue as folks, um, you know, age out and enter the workforce is that they're focusing a lot of energy on just complying, which means whether they understand you and what's going on or not, they're wanting to just do what's going to make people around them happy and keep them out of trouble. And this shows up a couple ways. Um, one thing is that um, people on the spectrum will do something called a default response. And that means they may have an answer that they give that isn't necessarily one that is based on comprehension of what's going on, but it's just kind of to ease the pressure and maybe take the um, focus off of them. So a lot of folks will say yes um, when they're asked a question or no when they're asked a question, whether they understand um, what they're responding to or not because of the processing issues. Um, they, they may not have understood what you're talking about, but they may still give you a response that they think is going to um, ease that pressure. The other thing that happens when, you know, people are trying to be compliant and fit in is that um, they'll ignore their own needs. This happens a lot, um, for example, with sensory issues. Um, I see a lot of folks on the spectrum who have issues uh, with fluorescent lights, for example, or noises. And um, those things can be very painful and disruptive, but um, folks are willing to ignore that to try to go ahead and fit in or, or to do the job or, or um, you know, to participate. And so a lot of ne important needs get ignored. And again, that leads to the burnout um, or to people shutting down. Autistic people have something called splinter skills. And what that means is there's a big discrepancy between, you know, relative strengths and weaknesses. So, um, for example, you know, I have a young man who is really good with dates and numbers. Uh, he, you know, he can memorize when your birthday is and he can uh, remember what date certain things happened on. And that's a strength of his. Um, on the other hand, he does not know what topics are socially appropriate to talk about um, in front of other people. And so he has this one area that he really excels in and then this other area that gets him into trouble a lot. And you'll find that for folks on the spectrum is that we have areas of real strength which are really different from our weaknesses. And, and where I find that that gets people into a lot of trouble is that people, when they see a specific strength or skill that a person has, it's easy to assume that they don't need help in other areas. And so your job, you know, as counselors, it's really important to dig in, of course, and figure out what those areas are where people need the support and um, 
that that's really challenging for you guys when you've got people who show up and um, can do certain things really well. One thing we find is that folks on the spectrum have really inconsistent performance and that's over time and depending on environment and circumstances as well. So you might have a person who performs a task really well in the morning um, and then the afternoon they're expected to perform that same task and they are not able to do it to that same level of precision. Um, or you may have days where a person is performing really well and then other days where they're not. And that can depend on the environment, circumstances, how they're feeling at any given time, who's involved, you know, if they feel safe and comfortable around somebody, if there's a change in staff or change in colleagues or they're not familiar with something that can really affect performance as well. So in terms of, you know, you folks, you know, assessing a person's abilities, it's really hard to do that just by um, assessing a person one time in one environment. Um, you may find that uh, a person's really inconsistent over time um, with their performance. One other thing that I see a lot with folks is that they'll do well initially um, and they may even really excel during, you know, an evaluation period. So for 60, 90 days, a person could do great um, in their in their employment, but then you know, 90 days down the line, or you know, a year down the line, that's when they may really be struggling. And that can have to do with the fact that at the beginning they're really geared up and they're giving it their all, and then they overdo it, and then they kind of break down because they've been overextending themselves. But it can also be a result of changes in the environment or circumstances. Let's say the, you know, the boss that they had that they knew and worked well with left and a new boss comes in and then all of the hard work that everybody's done, um, including the person who's working is kind of goes out the window and um, it's like you have to start over again. Um, Another thing is that folks on the spectrum may have difficulty really attending to tasks that aren't related to something they're really passionate about. And it's really important to recognize here that this is not a, it's not something that is about being lazy or non-compliant. I've talked with a lot of people through the years about this and it's, it's as if it's very exhausting and very cognitively or mentally difficult to focus on something that isn't related to their interest. And it could even be just attending to somebody's conversation about something they're not interested in. I mean, we all check out, you know, <laughs> sometimes if something doesn't interest us, but for those of us on the spectrum, it can be very exhausting um, given our processing issues and, you know, the way that we're wired to actually attend to something that we're not really passionate about. So it's kind of, we're kind of um, hot or cold or black and white about things. Either we're really, really going to know everything about something and really want to do something well, really obsess about it, or we don't want to have anything to do with it as a rule. One thing I find with a lot of folks on the spectrum is um, that there's a lot of metaphorical conversation that takes place. And what I mean by that is um, instead of being direct about something, um, a person might speak in metaphor, so they might um, they might talk about uh, um, something that happened in a story, like their favorite, you know, their favorite book or a movie or their special interest, and they may be talking about this other thing, and they may be meaning it in relation to something that's going on in their lives. Um, and and that's something that you might be hearing somebody talking about something. Um, an example I can give you is um, I have a, a guy who's obsessed with the military and um, with spies. And so every time um, we have a conversation about um, him and what's going on in his life, he's talking about his, um, his house as if it's like a, you know, a, 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 a safe, it's a safe house. And he talks about things in terms of weapons and, um, and missions and, but he's, he's really talking, when he's talking about these things, he's really talking about things going on in his own life. So that can be really challenging to figure out. Processing issues for folks on the spectrum mean that you may have a really long delay in feedback that you need um, 
to get in order to, um, you know, work with a person. And they may have a, um, a delay in understanding what it is that you're trying to communicate with them. So, and that delay um, can be, you know, just a few seconds. So one thing you can do is just, you know, give a person, you know, eight to 10 seconds to process things and that can really help. Um, but sometimes these processing delays take um, weeks, months, and, and sometimes years. I worked with um, folks who have had things that happened years ago and then like five years down the line or 10 years down the line, like, oh, all of a sudden I understand what that person meant five years ago. So that can be really a, a challenging issue if you're trying to get the information you need, the data you need to support people. Folks on the spectrum um, often have areas of their lives where they really lack self-awareness. And so you can ask a person, you know, hey, do you have any sensory issues? Or do you have any, you know, what would you, you know, like to do? And they maybe are not able to tell you. Um, and that doesn't mean there's not an issue or that there's not something going on. It just means they maybe don't know. Um, so we alluded to this a little bit earlier, but you know, some tasks and expectations that seem small to most people may feel really, really overwhelming to um, a person on the spectrum. And I'm just gonna give you one example of this. Um, there's huge conversations in the autistic community about um, phone anxiety. A lot of people on the spectrum really hate using the phone. And um, so just picking up the phone and making a necessary phone call, um, which is something that most people do every day and don't even think twice about, can cause a person really tremendous anxiety to the point that they will avoid doing it, even in needed, needed situations, like to call the doctor or you know, to get something fixed at the house. So that's, um, that's something to keep in mind as you're setting up plans to make sure that um, you know, goals and steps are achievable for that person, not just for the average person. Um, you know, folks on the spectrum are at greater risk of exploitation and bullying. And that happens a lot in the workforce. I mean, I see situations where the autistic person is, ends up doing the work of uh, other people who are happy to just say, oh, why don't you do my work and yours too? Um, and sometimes unhealthy um, cultures create situations where people are bullied in the workforce. Right now we have the issue of uh, face masks and that's causing people um, some new problems. And um, especially for those folks on the spectrum who do lip read and a lot of folks on the spectrum do do this, um, it really helps um, for processing to be able to watch lips for some people. And it, the masks um, can cause anxiety for a lot of folks on the spectrum. Um, you know, we talk about when we evaluate people that autistic people have unusual fears. Um, well, this, you know, phone phobia is one of those and um, fear of the masks is something that I'm dealing with a lot of clients who have anxiety around other people wearing masks. So um, one thing that you can do if you are wearing masks or people are wearing masks around your clients is to go ahead and just show your face um, that can help, you know, before you cover yourself up, if, if masks are something you're, you're having to do, or if your clients are exposed to other people with masks, um, that can really help give some context to a person. So, and we talked a little bit about the anxiety already. People can be anxious um, about all sorts of things. Um, and sometimes it's hard for you as the professional to figure out what that is. Um, but any kind of change is going to cause anxiety for people, um, any kind of transition and people can cause anxiety for folks on the spectrum. So something I want you guys to keep in mind is autistic folks typically have, you know, one or more um, co-occurring diagnoses. And these are some of the more common ones that I see uh, for folks on the spectrum for you to just keep in mind. And, you know, one thing that I think we really have to do for our autistic population is to make sure and refer um, for people to get other support, not just the services we're offering, but you can refer people um, to get support in these areas. Um, there is a significant 
um, increase in seizure activity in folks on the spectrum. And something I'm finding is that even though we know that we're not um, we're not um, having people tested for that when it when they're screened and it's it's warranted, and seizures can come in all sizes and shapes. So, um, you know, it's not just the person who falls down on the floor and is shaking uncontrollably with their bodies. Seizures can show up in rages. Some people can have seizures where they're like very angry and yelling and cussing. And other seizures are um, just very subtle, like a person might just get quiet and their eyes might glaze off for a second and then they'll come back. Um, so other um, conditions are vitamin and mineral deficiencies, sleep disorders, anxiety, trauma, depression. I Nine out of more than 90%, nine out of 10 people that I work with has trauma. Um, they all, every person I work with on the spectrum has anxiety um, and a significant amount of those have depression as well. A lot of our folks have gastrointestinal issues, um, secondary genetic disorders. Dysmenorrhea is a menstrual um, pain that is unusual and it can be really debilitating. I've noticed that for women on the spectrum that this is more severe than it is um, as a rule for typical women. And so I, I talked with a woman the other day who said she's out for a week, like she can't um, get out of bed for a week. And this can show up as you know vomiting and increase in anxiety. So these are, you know, um, things that will affect the consistency of a person's ability to search for employment and remain employed. Um, eating and swallowing disorders are a big thing. A lot of um, women on the spectrum actually get diagnosed with eating disorders before they get an autism diagnosis. And then addictions are huge. Um, a significant portion of the folks that um, I know about and work with throughout the years have some form of addiction. And that could be um, you know, whether it's, you know, the typical you know, being addicted to a medication or, you know, legal drugs and alcohol, but other addictions that are really going to impact your ability to help people are, you know, video game addictions or computer addictions, addictions to um, watching television. Uh, one thing that um, we're going to find is that it's really hard to get a person to get a good night's sleep and show up and do what they need to do. Um, for work and, or to find a job if, you know, if they're staying up all night playing video games. And that's a compulsion. It's not that they're choosing, you know, to do that. It's that they really are, um, it, you know, it's kind of, it's gotten out of control. And um, so you guys are dealing with a lot of folks, if you're dealing with folks on the spectrum who've got addictions of some sort or another. So, um so all behavior is a form of communication. What I'd like to do um, now is we're going to take a break at 10. So we've got about 10 minutes here. But I, before we do, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, get out of the slides for a moment and come back to the group. And I want to open it up to anybody who has any questions so far. We're going to talk about communication strategies next. But um, before we go for break, I want to open it up to any questions and you can either raise your hand or you can, um, you know, type a question in the chat. So I'm just going to give you a minute to, to do that. If we were in person, we could have those questions. I could see you and we could have those questions as we, we went along. But anything that wasn't clear or anything you'd want more elaboration on, um, then put that in the chat. So I just want to respond um, briefly to the um, some of the questions in the conversation that um, is taking place in the chat. I'm not going to go over everything. People can read that. Um, but a couple of these things I want to point out for um, the recording so people who are watching a recording can get this. Um, so Dr. Renee Lake is um, doing really stellar evaluations for people who have slipped through the cracks. Um, she works, she's very trained to evaluate um, girls and women as well as atypical men. And um, so I, I'll give you her contact information um, in when I share the notes. 
and the slides later on. Um, but she is really doing good work um, and she's in Mount Pleasant and people do travel to see her. So that's a, a really good resource for those people who have um, missed. I also have some screening tools that I think would be helpful for you that I'm gonna share. Um, I'll get these emailed um, to you guys. One is a screening tool specifically for females that helps you identify if you know somebody you're working with perhaps um, might benefit from pursuing an evaluation and um, there's a seizure screening tool as well that i you can just it's a really short thing that you can um, look at um, to evaluate if that's something that maybe needs to be looked at further. There is a, a question about how often um, we're seeing people who are missed at an early age on the spectrum. And it's an interesting question because I actually get um, people from all over the, the world who contact me on a regular basis who are um, adults who suspect that they're on the spectrum and had a host of other kinds of diagnoses, um, perhaps borderline personality disorder, or bipolar, or ADHD, or anxiety, social phobias are some of the more common ones. And um, so this is something that people contact me about all the time. I also work with a lot of um, parents who have a lot of guilt over realizing when their children are teens or young adults that um, they have a, a child who's on the spectrum and they didn't realize it when they were young and so they slipped through the cracks. So it's a really common thing um, that happens. So are there any other questions before we get started on the next part? Okay, so um, I always tell people that what's good for the autistic person is good for everyone. So we're going to be working with some strategies today that are um, going to be helpful for folks on the spectrum. But I want you to keep in mind that these are not going to hurt anybody that you use these strategies with. And in many cases, they may really help. If you're dealing with brain injury, if you're dealing with folks who have other kinds of developmental um, delays, um, folks with um, Down syndrome. The strategies we're talking about today will work for all of those folks, um, regardless of why um, they've come to. And even if they've just had an injury and they're no longer able to do their former job and are rehabilitating into some new task, um, but there's no you know, known cognitive issues, um, those folks will benefit from these strategies as well. Um, so the other thing is, uh, before I screen share, I want to give you guys um, a heads up that the third part of this training today is going to be you um, sharing your specific uh, challenges um, with um, folks that you've worked with in the past or folks that you're dealing with now. And so in order for this part of the training to be most beneficial, I want you guys to be thinking about uh, some of those cases that you can share with the group. So that can be really instructive and helpful to everyone um, for you to come up with those situations and, and be willing to share those um, with the group. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get into my slides again. And we'll talk about the strategies that we can use. Ink. So let's just pick up where we left off. And just a reminder that all behavior is a form of communication. So if somebody's avoiding something, you know, leaving a space, refusing to do something, that's a form of communication. If somebody is simming or banging their head or, um, you know, running back and forth, that is a form of communication. So keep that in mind as we're working on these strategies. So. One of the things I'd love for you guys to do, and I'll, I'll share a screening tool with you um, that you can have on hand if you feel it's appropriate at any time um, for sensory integration as well, is that we want to make sure that before we even try to 
communicate with a person, that they're actually able to hear us. And in order for a person to attend to communication, the sensory integration and anxiety issues have got to be addressed to a pretty good degree, or people are just not going to hear you. I mean, if you're afraid um, or feeling anxious um, or in pain and sick, you don't have the ability to listen and understand and learn as well as if you're feeling in a good way. And um, just, you know, to keep in mind again that a lot of these folks on the spectrum are hypersensitive and are feel things very passionately and very deeply. And so again, they may be feeling that something they're experiencing, whether that's a, maybe a social phobia or maybe it's, um, you know, they're smelling somebody's perfume and it's giving them a headache. That may seem small to most people, but to that person who's experiencing it, they may have had traumas in their life that that actually feels like their life is at threat. So a lot of folks on the, on the spectrum are constantly feeling in such a state of anxiety, in large part due to sensory issues, that they feel constantly like their life is at risk. And so it's important to keep that in mind and do what you can to address any sensory issues. And that's, you know, we're talking about for good job placement, but we're also talking about for their interactions with you in order to get the best um, you know, information from the folks you're working with. Um, you wanna make sure that um, any sensory issues are addressed and anxiety is addressed up front. And it could be anything as simple as, um, I don't use fluorescent lights in my office. I have incandescent bulbs. I actually specially order them, not just for me, because I have sensory issues with them, but for my clients as well. So a, a, like a warm yellowish LED is a lot better than um, fluorescent, for example. Um, and so that's just, you know, an example of a way you can address that and being, a, you know, attentive to any kinds of sounds, sounds that, you know, again, maybe popping a pop, you know, a soda can might not seem like a big deal to most people, but that could really be painful to somebody who's sensitive to it. So accommodation is really important. That's, you know, what we've been talking about in terms of sensory issues and anxiety leads up to this whole concept of accommodation. And I know that you guys are thinking about accommodation when it comes to getting people placed in, you know, the job site, but be thinking too about how you can do accommodations as you are getting to know a person and in your role as the counselor. Um, are there little things that you can do to accommodate a person like, you know, turning the lights off? Um, is just a really simple example. And a lot of times, if not always, but sometimes if you ask a person, how can I accommodate you? Um, oftentimes they're able to tell you. So um, keep that in mind. So I think one of the, the best things you can do in terms of establishing a really good kind of um, working relationship with a person on the spectrum is to use their special interest as a basis for communication and choosing employment options. So many times through the years, I've heard um, stories of folks on the spectrum who were placed in a job that was, had no, in, they had no interest in it um, and it wasn't suitable to their abilities. Um, so, that really does not end up being a positive experience for a person um, if, if they're not able to be fit into something that relates to their special interest in some way or another. Um, so um, we alluded to this a little bit earlier when I was talking with you about how um, folks often speak metaphorically. And um, one of the things that you can do is to really, if you are hearing a person use certain language, mirror that language with them. There was a, um, a little discussion in the chat about how masking and mirroring sound very similar, and they really are. Um, mirroring is a tool that's used to create um, empathy and to create rapport with somebody when you mirror what they do 
or acknowledge what they've said and that you understand it. So if, you know, if I lean in, you lean in. And, you know, autistic people are really good at this, but you can mirror as well. And that can really um, help. So if, if you've got somebody who's using specific keywords, you can, you can join them in their language and use their keywords um, as well. And that can really help them with comprehension. They've chosen those words, that particular phrasing for a reason. It either makes a lot of sense to them um, or it's something that's very pleasurable. A lot of times autistic people, we are very sensory oriented in terms of our language. We, we state things not just because uh, we want to communicate, but because it gives us um, a sensory um, pleasure, satisfaction in hearing certain um, certain things. Um, my son right now, who all, all my kids are out, uh, on the spectrum, and his my youngest, his his favorite line right now is from Wally, where they say "caution, rogue robots," and he just runs around saying it because it's pleasurable. So if you can, um, you know, hear something like that and that one of your clients says and then latch on to that and, and use it, um, that will help to create rapport and help that person, um, you know, feel re relatable and that you're communicating effectively with them. One thing that's very important is to repeat um, any kinds of directives or information across multiple environments and settings. Um, Oftentimes when I train people on communication, I say there's a magic rule of seven. So when you're working, let's say you're working with a person who is, um, you know, they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're now wheelchair bound. They were, you know, they were working in a, an assembly line and now they have to, you know, get a new job. But cognitively and communication wise, that's one of their strengths. Um, you might have to tell that person um, a directive or a request, you know, once, maybe twice, and they're going to understand it. Oftentimes, people on the spectrum are going to need multiple um, repetition of the same information before they process it. And what I've found is that oftentimes six or seven times um, is not unusual for a person to get it. Um, now, if it's clear somebody's understood something, of course, you don't have to repeat it. But if you're getting the sense that they're not grasping something, don't give up. Continue to repeat it. And um, you can do that in multiple ways. Phrase it differently. Um, we autistic folks can be really stuck on language. So if my notion of um, pants if the word for that is slacks, in my head, slacks means pants, and you use the word jeans or pants, I might get really stuck on that, or I might not really process what you're saying. So, you know, instead of using one word to describe something, think about multiple words that can give context. So it's not just a couch, it's a sofa. Um, so think about things in those terms of really thinking of as many ways and different environments where you can say things. And I think this is important, like one of the things that you as an organization are trying to do is make sure that you've got a lot of cohesiveness across the agency. We're going to be you know, training the job coaches on Wednesday. And so the idea is to make sure that everybody's working together, um, you know, in the same, you know, kind of um, way to support um, these folks. And so making sure that you know, you continue on with that in terms of having conversations with your colleagues and everybody in that person's team to make sure that that information that needs to be communicated and understood is shared by multiple people in multiple environments as well. So think of yourself as, you know, one person in that larger team who needs to be sometimes expressing information. One thing I hear a lot from folks who are able to communicate their challenges with communication is that a lot of times they'll go into a conversation and have no clue what the purpose of the conversation is about or the, the topic. And so they're really lost. And um, so before you start an explanation or before you start to talk about something, if you go ahead and just say the purpose of this is, 
and you give that as a preface to whatever you're saying, then that can really help a person, an autistic person focus their thoughts in. This works really well for um, folks who have a lot of executive function or ADHD issues, processing issues of other sorts as well, is just be real clear about what the purpose of whatever it is that you're doing is. The purpose of these questions is to help me see what kind of job you would like. The purpose of this meeting is, you know, to practice your interview skills. The purpose of this assessment you know, whatever um, the, that purpose is, state it, and then um, go ahead and go into what you need to communicate with the person. That can really help. Make sure that you're using sensory-friendly visual supports. And I, I put sensory-friendly in there uh, because oftentimes what I see is that people will implement visual supports and they're very visually overwhelming. There's a lot of um, information going on on that page. Like it's, a, you know, it's lots of words, maybe lots of images, and then the person can't attend to it. And just to give you um, an example of um, what I mean, when I, I can't order from a menu in a restaurant, um, because it just, when I see it, I, it, get, it overwhelms me and I shut down. Now, I'm a person who's read the complete works of William Shakespeare. I've read every single Harry Potter pro book probably five times, and some of them in a day or two. Um, for those of you who know Harry Potter, that some of those are 700 page long books. But there's just something about um, certain information that when it's presented with a lot of busyness, that it's going to be hard for people to, to utilize it as it's intended. But you can use calendars, you can use tasks and lists, you can use um, signs uh, if, if you need, um, you know, put stickers or notes on things. Jigs are really helpful for people who are having to learn tasks. I don't know if, for those of you who don't know what a jig is, let's say you're wanting to have somebody set the tables in a restaurant, you can actually, to train them to do that, you can actually have a little placemat that has a little picture of where the plate goes and a little picture of where the spoon goes and where the napkin goes and the fork goes and the cup. So that it's a visual prompt for a person. And it's very fascinating um, because not all, but a significant amount of folks on the spectrum are very visually um, oriented. A lot of us think in pictures, see things visually before words come to us. So that can be a really powerful tool if you use it correctly is to have visual supports. And I've seen situations where a person simply wasn't comprehending what they needed to, but as soon as they saw that visual support, it was like a light switch went on and they immediately got it. So anytime you are having difficulty um, having one of the folks that you work with understand something, going ahead and finding a way to incorporate a visual is a really good strategy to use. And we all use, you know, then we all have our calendars and our you know, lists on our phones and things. So the, the key here is that folks on the spectrum maybe need more visual supports in more contexts and um, they can really be helpful but make sure that they're very, um, very streamlined and very um, clear and clean. So, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about masking and default responses, how sometimes somebody will just say, yeah, 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 I get it, I understand, or um, will pretend like they know what's going on and, and they're really just trying to stay under the radar and not call attention to themselves. Um, and so, one thing you can do is to probe for comprehension. And there are a couple ways that you can do this. Um, you can request that the person say it in their own words, and um, or you can request that they demonstrate that they know what you're talking about. So I often do this with folks, and it's really interesting to see um, that sometimes they'll really come across as if they're really understanding. And when I say, hey, just so I can make sure I'm understanding, you know, that I'm communicating well, can you put that in your own words? Tell me in your own words. And if they can paraphrase it, then you know, okay, there's some comprehension. And if they can't, then you can go back and communicate that concept again. Um, and of course, demonstration is, um, is really good if, you know, you're having to, um, you know, 
see them do a task, just have them show, you know, show you if they can do it or not. Because of the communication challenges, it's really helpful if you just keep it concise and direct. Uh, a lot of preface of, you know, different kinds of words um, can really make things, you know, more confusing for the person. So if you can think about the communicating with a person on the spectrum is best done um, in Twitter form versus Facebook, where you just really distill it down to what are the most essential things that I need to say because I have limited space to work in. Um, that will really help. So all of your superfluous adjectives and descriptions, just keep those out. So um, instead of, hey, why don't you come over here and sit down? It's just sit here. Um, and that, that makes it a lot easier for a person to really focus in on what's important versus having to pick through the language. One of the things that happens for a lot of folks on the spectrum is we have very relational um, way of thinking when it comes to language. So if they hear, you know, if a person hears a word or um, sees something, um, we'll go off on tangents, our brains will go off on, on tangents. And so the more concise you keep things, the more you have control of directing where the conversation goes versus, uh, versus allowing us and our imagination to go on to, you know, this thought, which reminds us of this thing that happened and that next thing that happened um, that are all related in our minds, but aren't relevant to what you need to do and, um, and accomplish together um, in your role. So just to build on that a little bit, it's also really important to keep things very concrete. Uh, you know, instead of saying doing, you know, you're doing a great job, specify how it's a great job. Um, great job does not mean anything to a person on the spectrum usually. That's very, very, um, very vague and very abstract. And so if they showed up on time, then say that. You showed up on time today, thank you. Um, or, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, you're very detailed, good work with the detail, you know, let them know that. Because great job can mean anything for them if you don't specify it. And so anytime that you have um, something that you're wanting to share, um, adjectives and adverbs are not going to help usually. So any kinds of descriptions need to be very concrete. One thing you can do in terms of planning is to give uh, plenty of advance notice for something and paint a clear picture for the person of what they're gonna expect as they're going through the process. So um, autistic people, it's not gonna work for you to just you know, show up or say, hey, we're coming and we're having you here today. Um, you know, if you show up at the group home and that person hasn't had time to prepare, they're not going to be able to focus on and attend to whatever it is that you have as a task for them. So make sure they have plenty of advance notice and that they can do all of the preparation they need to in their minds over a period of you know days, if possible, so that they can be um, ready to really focus in. Um, there are exceptions to that. There are some people who get really anxious and worry about that appointment coming up. And if you have somebody who's anxious, you know, about advance notice, of course, don't do that. But a significant amount of folks on the spectrum really like to know ahead of time what they're getting, you know, into. And so sharing that in advance will really help them be ready, um, you know, to do the work together. So when we're talking about clean, paint a clear picture of what to expect at all levels of your interaction, what I mean by that is to make sure they know, you know, what is going to be expected of them, where they're going to be, what you're going to do. Um, and just to give an example of how our minds work um, in this regard, um, I ordered a bunch of my books to show up at my house one day. And I spent probably three days being anxious about the fact that I was not going to be strong enough to pick up the box and bring it in the house 
because I ordered enough books, I knew it would be too heavy. And so I spent all this time imagining the box, sitting on my front porch and figuring out how am I going to get it in the house? Well, when the books arrived, of course, the folks at the shipping plant had packed the books in two separate, very manageable boxes. So all my worries were about, you know, this thing that didn't even happen. And that's a really common, um, you know, autistic thing. So if you can be real clear about, you know, when you show up, you will meet in this room, there will be one person. Um, I'll ask you, you know, 10 questions. Well, it'll take about 20 minutes. I mean, if you can just really show those kinds of details, then it will prevent a person's imagination from going wild and from them, you know, visualizing in their mind something that isn't even remotely what's going to happen. So one of the challenges that you guys are going to have with folks on the spectrum is, um, <clears throat> you know, with executive function issues and anxiety, you have people who show up late, you're going to have people who forget appointments or um, you know, sleep through them. And so it's really important for you to build in extra time to accommodate for this. And <clears throat> I know what some of you may be thinking is, well, if they really want, you know, to, to be employed and if they're really ready, they'll, they'll show up <clears throat> when they're supposed to. But this is not about laziness and it's not about not caring it's, you know, it's about the, you know, how autism is disabling for some people. And so when I, I want to tell you a little story about a young man named Dan, who, when I first started working with him two years ago, um, he, he was really in a bad way, depressed, suicidal, and um, had quit a job because he'd burn out. He had been working way too many hours. He'd been taking on, you know, tasks from, um, his colleagues, he was delivering pizzas, and it really had ended up with him being burnt out. And uh, when we first started meeting, he couldn't remember the times that we were supposed to meet, and he would show up late every time. Well, this is usually how folks on the spectrum start the process, and it's through actually shaping that behavior that they learn um, to, you know, get their act together. So I just, every time that um, we had an appointment. I had other things that I would do at the time when I told him to show up, but I always planned that he would show up um, between 30 and 45 minutes late to an hour late. And I just knew that was his pattern given his executive function abilities at that time. Um, and so I shaped that behavior. And um, today he's the one who calls and sets the appointments with me. He's on time. If he has to cancel, he'll cancel, he'll reschedule. And he's, he's doing great with it. He's, he's got an internship. They're looking to, to pay him for that internship now. Um, so just recognize, I, I realize you may not be able to do the kind of accommodation that I did with this young man, but just recognize that you're going to have to build in extra time and know that sometimes they're going to fail at these basic things like showing up on time and um, remembering to do things. Um, and, you know, if they have assignments, things they're supposed to bring to their appointment or things they're supposed to do, um, they may very well forget. And it's, it's not because they don't care. It's, it's, you know, nine times out of 10, it's because they're having processing and executive function issues or they're anxious. It's a really good idea to state boundaries, rules, and expectations ahead of time. Um, because if you don't, um, your folks that you work with can end up getting themselves into a lot of trouble without realizing it. Um, so just, you know, a good example of that is, um, you know, you can't assume that, you know, the person you're working with knows that it's not appropriate to talk about, um, you know, to get into a heated political discussion or to make, you know, comments about a pretty girl at work or to, you know, ask somebody out on a date, they may not know these things. And so it's important that you um, let them know what the boundaries are ahead of time. In my experience, folks on the spectrum really love to follow the rules as long as we know what they are. 
And so if you can set those up ahead of time, that eases anxiety and keeps people out of trouble. So, and that's in terms of how you are going to interact with them to do your job, and then also preparing them for you know, the workforce. So with that, um, let's stop sharing and see if anybody has um, any other strategies that you have found um, are effective. Um, that work you'd like to share with everybody else here today. You can raise your hand or you can type something in the chat. <clears throat> okay, so I don't see anything. Any questions? Oh, is an hour appointment too much for some people? Great question. So yes. Um, this is a, actually, I'm really glad you bring this up because I have some um, clients that I set half hour appointment and anything past a half hour is way too much. So between 20 minutes and 30 minutes for some people is just, they're not going to do anymore because they're flooded. Their brains have just overwhelmed at that point. So um, I do set half hour appointments with um, a lot of the folks that I meet with, and that can be very productive. On the other hand, I have folks who I set two hour appointments with because their communication is so tangential and they're very um, obsessive with how they think things through and very intense. And so some people I actually um, end up doing like a two hour session um, to get them focused to where they need to go to think things through and just for me to give them that time to actually talk it out and then I can see where they're going with all of their tangents and bring it in is helpful. So yeah, um, an hour can be too much for some people. A lot of times they'll be able to tell you or you'll just see they're glazed over and you see the work stops, they're just not productive anymore. So, Other questions? So, um, yeah, so T. Lawrence says, and I'm going to read this out loud for the um, sake of the recording. I've discovered having the consumer discuss a rule the AC being broken with me rather than taking control and solving the problems themselves is beneficial. For example, grabbing a phone out of their hand when they've been told no phones. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's a really, um, a really good point. Um, that is that is very that can be very effective so um yeah because most of these guys they want to follow the rules so when you can help them and you can be honest with them about you know and direct about what they need um that's great yeah and then um okay and ws smith one says just a willingness to be flexible and meet the person where they are I have a consumer that initially only wanted to communicate through his grandmother, then he was open to email, and now we text. We are working up to talking on the phone. That is, an, yeah, such a helpful suggestion. Sometimes what I see happen is that, um, you know, folks are, like, punished because they're not ready to talk on the phone, and, um, and that's a big one. And so then the process just stops right there. And the person doesn't get the support that they need. And so that shaping that behavior and just allowing them to feel comfortable really will allow them to take the steps that they need to. What's interesting is, you know, in all the years that I've been doing this, I've not met a truly lazy autistic person. We use that word a lot when it comes to people on the spectrum and autistic people use it a lot for themselves. But I think that um, there's so much going on in terms of processing and sensory issues and pain and anxiety that um, an autistic person has is, is constantly working in overdrive. And so when you um, listen to what they're ready to do when they're ready to do it, they will take those risks and um, they'll do really well with them. That's great. And so Jennifer says, um, I've had a consumer on the spectrum who is very similar with rumination and required extra time. It was helpful to schedule her as the last appointment of the day. So no matter how much time was required, we weren't rushed to ensure she was comfortable in leaving. It's a great, 
strategy. If you can schedule things so you can give them that extra time, really good. Um, Nick says, um, some really benefit from advance notice of any changes. Many times I mentioned we'll talk about a topic in a week or two just to let them prepare mentally, then they're prepared for when we talk about actually making the change. It's a great strategy, yes. Um, okay, so another great question. Is it ethical to call someone on the autism spectrum autistic or should we say the person's on the autism spectrum? We've been taught person first vernacular. I love this question. Thank you for bringing it up. So folks in the autism community, most people who are autistic prefer to be called autistic. Um, it's professionals who have decided that um, we should um, call people a person with autism. Now, some people just don't care, but there's a lot of heated discussion. And most people on the spectrum prefer to be called autistic. And so that's the term I use um, because I'm honoring what um, the folks I work with have as a preference. And so great question. Um, you may find some people who decide, no, I wanna be called a person with autism. So you really, of course, wanna do that according to what um, the person prefers. Um, but yeah, it's perfectly ethical and you'll find that um, a lot of autistic people will applaud you for doing that. So. Um, Sumter Office says, I've noticed one individual wants to continue venting past the point that they know they've been heard and understood. Any suggestions on helping her move on? Okay, yeah, that's another great question. So we're dealing with a lot of perseverative thinking, of course, when we're dealing with autism, and we're dealing with a lot of traumas. And so for that person, it's not just about feeling heard and understood. That person is caught in this feedback loop. And so it's, it's really about addressing that underlying trauma, which is beyond, of course, the, the scope of what you do in your role. But I think it's a really good thing to refer folks when you get somebody who's really stuck on that same thing um, to a, a therapist who can deal with working with folks on a spectrum and and know how to deal with trauma um, moving on really sometimes you can um, um, if you need them to move on for that moment um, you can use um, you know um, something visual for them so a lot of times I, a lot of the folks I work with love computers and so I'll say okay you've got that tab in your computer right now can we go ahead and minimize it we'll pull it up later but right now I need you to minimize that tab and pull up the tab of you know you know this instead so um, really creating a visual way for them to compartmentalize and know they can come back to it later um, that's one good thing. But really, when you're finding folks who get caught in that, make sure that you're um, looking for resources to help them actually deal um, with the trauma in a therapeutic way, because it's often what it is. Yeah. So um, you're welcome. No problem. So any other questions that you've got for in terms of the strategies or any other strategies people would like to bring up? Okay. Handshakes can be difficult as well. COVID has helped with that since everyone is avoiding that now, but some employers get offended when a handshake is declined by someone who did not want to shake the person's hand. Preparing ahead of time can be helpful. Demonstrating as well as verbal instructions are often beneficial. Yeah, I think we've, you know, we're kind of in a dilemma right now. We're in limbo with COVID changing a lot of our rules. And of course, this is causing a lot of anxiety for those of us on the spectrum. And I am not immune to that. I have really struggled, um, you know, going places and, um, and, and doing things as a result of all these new rules we have. I think we've got to come up with new um, I don't know, um, ways to interact that everybody can agree on um, because handshakes, some people are wanting them and some people are not feeling comfortable yet. Um, so um, I know I love how in a lot of the Asian cultures, there's um, in Indian cultures, there's the bow. And I think that's a great thing. Maybe we can adopt that. <laughs> I don't know, but that's a definitely a challenge. But your point um, is that demonstrating um, and verbal instructions are good and preparing in advance 
is is important. So I have Thomasina Kelly says I have a consumer on the spectrum who constantly self doubts and speaks negatively regarding his abilities. What are some strategies to help increase self confidence? I've accompanied him on his job and often reinforce his accomplishments. Okay. Yeah, guys. This is really going to be something that whether a person on the spectrum is communicating those self doubts or not, they're having them because they live in a world where the way that they're wired, they've been taught, you know, not necessarily by parents or by you guys, but somebody in their life has said that they're at fault for being who they are. And so um, this is a, a situation where we've really got to teach people to unlearn this negative programming. And something that I really recommend is um, to make sure that folks on the spectrum are able to have access to um, other autistic mentors and autistic community. So um, that helps to unlearn some of that negative programming and to you know, build up um, you know, a new story in the person's head about who they are as a person. When you get together and you begin to relearn your life according to you know, the idea that, hey, I'm autistic and you know, I've been through all of these struggles and I've survived and you begin to understand that you're not lazy, you're not stupid, you're not crazy, you just are wired differently, that's a game changer for people. And it doesn't matter how you know, how cognitively bright you are, how verbal you are or aren't, um, you're going to have those kinds of self-doubts. So I recommend, you know, pairing with mentors and having opportunities for community to get together and share where you've got, you know, some really, some folks on the spectrum who have been through it and worked through that process and come to, a, you know, a place in their um, thinking that's more healthy. Um, so, and yeah, that you're reinforcing his accomplishments um, on the job, that's great, but that doesn't replace um, our internal self thought that has to be reprogrammed. And that's, um, that's a process. So I hope Thomasine, does that give you, did I answer that question? Okay, for you? That, is that something like, do you guys have access to like, would you know how to have access to like the autistic community, people who could mentor and, and provide that sort of um, guidance? Okay, all right. All right, so it is 11 o'clock. And um, I'd love to go ahead and, you know, brainstorm some specific cases that you're having. I know you've talked a little bit about some of um, them in the chat, um, but are you, are you having other situations where you've not been, you know, you've not been successful at retaining a person, like they, they didn't follow through or they weren't able to, um, you know, do things. Talk with me about some of your, your, your cases that you have that have either been challenging in the past, you wish you'd done things differently, or um, cases you're dealing with now. Okay. I'm struggling a bit with a consumer who seems very resistant to challenging and negative and challenging that negative mindset. We got him a job and he was excited, but he's since quit due to how a manager spoke to him. Yeah. Um, so in cases like this, it's really baby steps. Um, a lot of these guys are going to be super sensitive. And it's funny, there's, it's like a, you know, it's a contrast. They might tell you your shirt's ugly, um, but if somebody sounds a little bit harsh, they might be, you know, really sensitive about, about it. So one thing is that um, when you've got somebody who is sensitive, I find that really handpicking that first employer 
um, in like a, usually like in a, a smaller place, a mom and pop store where you've got somebody who has got a little bit of experience already with, um, you know, or has a heart for it. Like maybe they have a family member on the spectrum or somebody who's you know really willing to go above and beyond um, can really help so that your, your expectation of what that client is able to do is it, you're starting at a smaller base. Um, so I'm just thinking right now, BB and T a um, few years back, for example, found that they had um, the, the bank BB and T found that they had some data issues that could not um, their um, their team couldn't look at the data and figure it out. Um, so they recruited a um, a young autistic man who. Um, had the number sense the ability to look at the data a certain way that was his skill his his gift um, and bb and t was very careful about managing ma ma matching his um, his go-to person um, they chose very specifically um, a person who um, really had a heart for it and they knew would be very patient and had the type of demeanor that would work with this young man. And so really handpicking those um, people for first jobs, I think is in those cases is really important when it's possible. And I know that's in some ways that's kind of asking the impossible, but you guys already do, you're already doing so much. Um, I'm wondering, is this young man who's struggling, is he willing to try a new job is he willing to try again or is he shut down? W.S. Smith one. I'm wondering if we could actually have a conversation, um, can we find you. Can sure, you I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So is, is he willing to try a new one or what's going on? Give me more information. He does. Um, he's pretty specific and where he wants to go. Um, and, and just to explain a little bit about the other job, it was at an Ingalls. Um, and we had, we had, um, it was a direct placement in our terms because we had worked directly with a manager, um, uh, supported him during the interview, um, you know, checked in on him regularly, spoke to the manager one on one. But you know, he wasn't the only manager he was dealing with. That particular manager who hired him worked quite well with him, mm -hmm. but it was another manager um, that would, you know, just say things to him and his. He had made some friends there, which was really encouraging, I think, to both of us. Um, but apparently this manager would kind of get onto them for, for talking some or for grouping up together and maybe not being as productive as they could be. And um, he felt like she was targeting him in a sense. Um, but anyway, he, he does seem open to applying to other places. Um, but he always kind of has this mindset, like, I'm just gonna mess it up, you know? So I constantly have to remind him about the things he's done well and the progress he's made. Yeah, it's such a self-defeating kind of thing. And he's had a history of that. And so you can really be good at messing things up. And then it's better if I just mess things up, right, than, you know, give it a full go and then be disappointed when it doesn't work out. Right. So, yeah, I think in cases like this, whenever it's humanly possible, placing where you know that that person has the one contact person grocery stores actually stores are really hard placement for a lot of folks because of the sensory issues there i mean i'm going to be honest i don't shop in grocery stores i can't because i have to go home and nap for three hours i'm so overwhelmed um, so there's a lot going on in grocery stores so i actually have my food people shop for me or I order my, you know, my food. Um, but in grocery stores, you are going to have other managers there. So if, if you can at all find like a little mom and pop place for starters, where it's um, just, you know, one person only, you know, has that interaction and communication, I think you're going to have better success. The other thing is, um, you know, referring him to get 
you know, some help with a good therapist who can help, you know, do the challenging. Cause that's, you know, that's definitely work that's beyond the scope of what you guys, you know, can do um, is, I mean, you can do the positive reinforcement, but you can't do the therapy and he's really going to have to, you know, take a, you know, he's really going to have to have some more intensive support in, in doing that um, to challenge that. Cause that's rewiring how his brain is, is, you know, perceiving things. Um, for sure. Um, so yeah, any other thoughts or things you wanted to say about that or All right. um, I think that was it, you know, open to if anybody has anything else to recommend, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, right now that's kind of where I'm focused is just challenging the, the negative mindset. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, w I don't know what your drawing skills are. <laughs> um, they don't have to be great, but a lot of times when I have some, a concept like this, because it's very abstract, um, I will actually draw out a diagram so that it's when I'm with the person. So it's very visual so they can see what we're talking about. And it doesn't have to be beautiful. It's just, you know, it might have up, you know, ups and downs or arrows or a name with a circle around it connected to somebody else, just so that you can kind of punctuate um, what you're saying that can really be helpful to sketch it out. Or if you, um, you know, have some, you know, if you can find an illustration or a visual support that expresses it, that can really be helpful. So. All right. Does anybody else have any things you're you're dealing with? I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> you guys have very, um, you know, very uh, challenging jobs, and you're dealing with a lot of um, a lot of folks with a lot of need. So. I'm here. Yeah, Andrea. Yes. Yes. I met with a um, architect last week, and he is on the system, and he. Andrea, we're having a hard time hearing you, hon. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure what the volume is. Um, yeah. Can you hear me better? That is better. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I met with an applicant last week. And we are moving forward with opening his case, but he is on the spectrum. He got his teaching certification in the spring and started what he thought was going to be his dream job this fall and um, worked about two and a half months and they let him go. Apparently, um, he was informed that there were several girls in the class that had complained that he was looking at them inappropriately. And so he was very upset in my office talking about how hard he has worked all of his life to be able to make eye contact and to be able to look at people. And now he kind of feels like that's completely undermined and he's just not quite sure, you know, how to even process that or, or what to do with that. And so hopefully you can add a little insight for that. Yeah. Oh, that's, a, I'm so glad you bring this up. It breaks my heart. Um, and it's, um, it's an issue that happens a lot with compliance training. So these, these guys, when they're young, are forced to make eye contact. They're trained, which is a very painful experience for them in the first place. So, like, physically and emotionally, it's painful. So it's kind of a little torture that we put these guys through when we force them to make eye contact. And then when they learn to do it, a lot of times it is too intense. It's not the way that a neurotypical person is going to make eye contact. There's not going to be the give and take, the look away um, that we expect. It's a very like, I'm going to stare you down because I'm working on making eye contact. And I have no doubt he meant nothing inappropriate by it. He was, he was wanting to show them that he was paying attention and that he cared um, in his role as teacher. So um, what one tip that you guys can use with anybody who has difficulty with eye contact is um, I teach face contact versus eye contact. I don't make eye contact. 
Um, rarely do I do that. It's just, it doesn't help me to process and attend to the person. It's very uncomfortable. Um, and so I watch people's mouths um, and some people like to watch the ear or the nose, but I think him going ahead and practicing fine tuning that skill now um, so that if he's looking in the person's vicinity um, versus straight at the eyes, that can actually be more comfortable to him and more comfortable to the other person that he's um, interacting with. So you, that's a really quick strategy you can work with people on is just face contact. So look at the mouth, look at the ear, um, and then work with them on the idea that, and demonstrate, you know, this is staring somebody down you know, and um, that there needs to be gaps in, in the time that you look. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, it's not like he's, he would be really receptive to just fine tuning those skills. Yeah, um, I definitely got that impression. I just wasn't quite sure at that time um, how to move forward with that. So I appreciate your insight very much. Yeah, yeah, good luck with, with, with that. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So there's a question in the previous situation. Is there a chance of offending the person with the illustration? Could it be perceived? I'm assuming they need this illustration when in fact they may not don't want to make assumptions based solely on their diagnosis. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, that's a totally legitimate question because, you know, everybody's different and people, um, you know, may see things differently and you may find somebody who's um, offended. I um, have never found anybody to be, um, upset with it. Um, and I do that frequently with folks that I'm working with. Um, but one way that I think that you can, um, you know, address that, you know, that you don't want to appear as if you're insulting their intelligence is, you know, when you're having your intake, when you're getting to know them, you know, go ahead and, you know, and ask about, you know, where, what are your, you know, what are your strengths? And, I, and I know you have your assessments, you know, but find out how, you know, how strongly they are reliant upon visuals. And, um, you know, you can say, I, you know, it helps me if I draw it out, you know, it's going to be a case by case basis, but I've honestly never had that be an issue because when, you know, you know, if people come to me, they're, they're seeking help. Um, so, I think one thing you could do in a case like that is go ahead and, and say, you know, I, I feel like I'm not explaining this very well. Um, would you mind if I drew it out so that you put it on yourself versus, you know, you don't understand what I'm saying. So I have to draw it out for you. Um, you could go ahead and put it on yourself. Like, I'm not sure I'm making myself clear. Can I go ahead and write it out? Um, but I love that you're thinking um, in those terms because one of the issues you know we often have one of my pet peeves is when people baby talk um, somebody on the spectrum. You know, you got a grown adult, and oh, we're talking with them like they're a baby, right, honey? And that you know, you, you want to treat folks like the um, you know the wonderful adults that they are. So I, I, I love that you're being aware of that and being respectful of not wanting to insult their intelligence. So, yeah. Other issues or questions? And if you, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and talk, you can, or if you want to write something in the, the chat. Hey, Tony, y'all, this is Jimmy Bennett here from your Hartsville office. And um, I've been dealing with a consumer for a while, and he was focused on becoming a radiologist. Um, he's on the spectrum. However, um, he failed um, the program. And now I'm trying to get him back, refocus on his education, because it seems like now he's sort of infatuated with uh, travel. A lot of times when I'm talking to him, he's traveling on, on cruises. It's like he just forgot the education part of it. So is there any way for me to help him get back refocused? Oh, wow. Yeah. So he may just need a, a break. I, I think um, that 
these folks who are going and getting their education, this is an extremely challenging situation. And I actually have um, a contact for you guys um, who works um, pretty passionately with this. Um, she's a social worker on the spectrum who really struggled to, um, you know, get her degree and it wasn't easy um, and people were not willing to accommodate very well. I also have a, a gal at um, the Medical University of South Carolina who's going for her psychiatry degree and they were very, have been very reticent to give her the accommodations that she needs. Um, so this is a huge challenge that you guys who are dealing with higher education are going to have to to be dealing with. Um, but I think this is definitely something that is don't go at this alone. Um, there are people out there who really focus on advocating for accommodations in that higher education realm who could really help support folks like this um, when he is ready to get back. Um, I would check with him on, you know, when, you know, that, that he, he probably needs a break because people get burned out really easily going through that process. But when, you know, asking how long do you think it will be, you know, how, before you're ready to get back at it and let him know you'll have, you know, some different resources for him if that's something he, he wants to do. But it's really tough for these guys to get through those higher education classes without, you know, that support on, on accommodation. So um, anybody who has a person who's struggling with that, let me know and I will put you in contact with a an individual who it's her passion to really help people get through that and she would mentor and be willing to talk to and give um, support. She knows the laws and she kind of knows how to, how to do it. Um, so Jimmy, if you want to reach out to me at my email, I'll have, I'll be happy to give you her information so that that's a resource for you. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right. So one, Let's see. Okay, I have a consumer with a diagnosis of ASD as well as ADHD and some physical limitations. He always expresses that everything is fantastic, but we've been working on the same goal for over a year. I'm not sure how to help him proceed forward. Yeah, so it's interesting. A lot of times um, that could be fantastic, could be a default response, like just what he, <laughs> Um, he's saying, um, and, and there may be some lack of self-awareness there as well. Um, can Rachel, can you talk with me? Can you unmute yourself and we, I can learn more about what the goal is. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Yeah. So when I first met with him, he participated in our work keys, um, certification, which is like some academic testing. And he actually did really well. Um, did not, he doesn't have his high school diploma because school was really hard for him. So he had dropped out. Um, but he identified a goal of wanting to attain his GED um, so that more work options would be available to him. Um, he really, because of his physical limitations, can't stand for more than 10, 20, 10 to 20 minutes. Um, so that limits a lot of what he's able to do. Um, so he has this goal of his GED um, and he'll always tell me that he's working towards it, but it's really probably been close to two years um, where we're just kind of same spot where he's just kind of getting started. Um, I've tried to include his family to see, um, but I think he does struggle with the video games and kind of his schedule at home as well. Mm -hmm. So I think He's kind of torn to about what's a priority. Okay. Um, Rachel, what does, you know, beyond his GED, like what, what's his dream job? Like what would he love to be doing if he had a magic wand? He loves computers. Um, so again, I think something where additional education would be needed. Um, but yeah, he can talk about anything with computers, not just games, but programs, yeah. websites, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I have a couple thoughts for you to process here with this. Um, first of all, I, I recently um, 
tried to help another individual get through the GED. And we had the same thing where he's like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. And he made zero progress. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm going to be frank. The GED program that he was working on was so God awful boring. And it, the questions were terrible. They weren't in, you know, they were like poorly worded. And so um, it, it was awful. (laughs) Um, and so we reevaluated with him because he tried and it just wasn't working. Um, you know, what it was that he really wanted, he wanted to go um, back and learn more about horticulture. So we said, you know what, let's skip the GED. You want to do horticulture. He's a landscaper right now. Um, and so I said, I got him paired up with um, a horticulturist who's mentoring him and he's actually getting um a great education. She's um, scholarshiped him for a horticulture class that she does, which really is more um, suited to what he wants to be doing anyway. And he's thrilled and he's making progress. So um, I I gave up on the GED in his case. (laughs) Um, And so I think it's really important to keep in mind what is the ultimate end goal. And with computer work, I know a lot of autistic people who didn't get any sort of um, degree or education, but they got mentored or they were self-taught. And there are, um, you know, technology companies that are willing to mentor and work with somebody like that and help support them. I've got a couple folks that I'm working with right now who are not getting an education in computers, but they're getting the best education from the pros who are out there teaching them how to do it. So it can really be something, you know, computers are something that they don't care if you've got a degree, they want to know if you know how to do the work um, in a lot of cases. So you might want to look at finding him, you know, a technology mentor um, in a place where he could maybe learn more on the job. And that would be a more direct route versus the GED would be an, you know, an idea, an option. Right. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, Anytime you have somebody who's not making progress like that, it's a really good idea to say, okay, this isn't working. Let's regroup and try something different. So I'm glad Rachel that you had the like awareness that, yeah, it's, it's just not going anywhere. Uh Yeah. Um, All right. So one of my clients, a mental health professional has been searching for someone who specializes in working with adults, but has only been able to um, find therapists in her area that focus on children. Any thoughts? So um, I, can I have some area office get online so I can get some more clarification on this? Yes. Hey, can yeah. you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, so talk to me a little bit more about this. So they're a mental health professional and they're wanting to find somebody who works with adults to help them or to like have a job in an area where there's the focus. Yeah, in, in the area, I mean, in the vicinity. That's what I meant by that. But yes, uh, she's looking for someone to help herself. Okay, so like to, where, what, She's in some, the Sumter area? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you know specifically like what kinds of things she's hoping to get some support on? Really struggles with organization. Um, and, you know, first, uh, after I heard you talk about the, the extreme empathy, <clears throat> she really uh, can't, seems like, turn uh, somebody down. So she gets tasks started, uh, but she doesn't finish because somebody will give her a call. And next thing you know, she's got 10 tab, uh, tabs up, 10 tasks, uh, things going on at the same time. So she's never completing anything. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, talking to her, uh, very, very upset about it and very emotional. Okay. About the job and is afraid of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's a, a gal here. Would she be open to virtual? I think she would be open to anything. Anything. Okay. So I have two thoughts. Um, there's a gal here named Katie Hogston who does phenomenal work with executive function stuff. She's really good about, you know, helping people to hone in on organizing their, their stuff. That is her specialty area. She's actually a speech therapist. And so, um, 
if you want to um, go ahead and email me, I'll be sure and I don't have her information off the top of my head right now. Uh, actually, let me get it and put it in the chat for you guys. I'll look it up. Um, but um, she would be somebody that I think might be good. The other thing is that um, if you wanted to send her to my website, I do like a free hour long like brainstorm session. And I'd be happy to, you know, chat with her. Um, and, you know, if, you know, either connect her with some other folks on the spectrum who, you know, might be good for her to just have that community connection, or if she felt like um, I might be able to help her, um, that would be something that, that, that we could do. Um, Thank you. I think it'd be great. Yeah. I, I really love, um, meeting with folks and getting them sent in the right direction. So anytime that you have, um, you know, a client that you feel needs that additional support um, in the autism community, and you maybe don't, you know, know what the resources are, you can send them my way um, via email or, you know, doing my little, um, you know, they can schedule an appointment in my little um, consultation, free consultation, because, uh, I'm happy to send people the right direction. Um, let me, I'm looking up Katie's phone number here, just a second. Um, all right, so Katie's information. I'm gonna put her in the, um, this is her phone number, Katie H, and it is 508212. She's in the Charleston area, I think. Um, Six five nine zero. Um, make sure I got that right. Yeah, so um, that's Katie's information for anybody who has executive function challenges, um, emotional regulation. She's really good with that. So, okay. All right, so Betsy says, I work with someone once with Asperger's syndrome to prepare them for work and we covered everything that could possibly happen on the job. They felt ready to work, we'd found a placement, but the morning they were to go to work, it was very cold. Uh, my consumer had to wear a coat to leave the house, but he couldn't leave the house that morning because he felt the puffy coat was going to or make him look heavy. He's approximately six feet and has a BMI of 10%. Mm -hmm. Took over an hour for him to feel ready to leave the house. We went over the work dress code, but I didn't think of the weather and that implication. I learned from that specific situation, expanding what I thought was job ready to what my client feels means job ready specifically to them as an individual. I love that story. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, I think the biggest challenge that you guys have is that everybody is such an individual, specifically with when you're dealing with autism, no matter how much training you have, somebody's going to throw you for a loop. And that's a really great um, example of that. Thank you for sharing. Um, and one of the things, you know, that these guys need to learn is how to deal with things when they don't go the way you, you expect. Um, and that's, that's a hard lesson <laughs> um, for us to learn. Anybody else have anything they would like to share? You can, you can unmute yourself and start talking or put it in the, in the text. Well, I really want to thank you guys for accommodating the virtual appointments. I know it's really challenging to do a training this way, um, especially when you're dealing with all of the technical um, issues and not being able to see each other face to face. Um, but I know that what I'd love for you guys to do is over the next several weeks, um, just you know, keep in mind some of the things that we've talked about today and, you know, take, you know, at least maybe one or two different things that came up that uh, you feel like you can implement in your own specific situation, working with the folks that you're, you're 
um, working with. And in, um, I think in January, some point, we don't have a date scheduled, but after the holidays, um, we'll get together again and we'll do a follow-up. And so between now and then you can be thinking of any other cases that you're having um, that you'd like you know, to do some brainstorming on and we'll, we'll follow up then. Um, and in the meantime, um, my email will be on the slides, but it's Tony at TonyBoucher.net. And I encourage you if you, I've just put that in the chat area. Um, if you have any questions or things that come up you know, after the, you know, fact, um, shoot me an email and um, we can go ahead and, um, you know, address those things. If you're needing a resource or you have a specific client that you're thinking of that needs a resource and you don't, you know, you could use some help finding that resource, uh, let me know. I'm happy to share any of you know, the resources that I know about. Um, and, and get people pointed in the right direction. I really think, you know, referral is an art and uh, it's really, uh, you know, great that you guys are thinking about getting your clients connected to other um, resources and professionals because it's, um, you know, it's us all working together as a community to support these beautiful people. So thank you for taking your time uh, spending the whole morning with me today virtually. It was really a pleasure to uh, get to work with you today. And I really appreciate your time. And we'll be, um, if I don't hear from you in an email, we'll be in touch in the training in, in January. So thank you, everybody. Tony, thank you so much. Um, we really enjoyed you and the information was very informative and great. Um, you did such a great job. Um, and you guys, as Tony mentioned in January, we will do a follow-up. So of course you will receive your um, information via email from um, Ms. Cribb um, at HRD regarding our next steps in January. Um, also, this has been recorded, so you guys will have access to it, and I will be sending out the PowerPoints um, that Tony uh, discussed, all the information she discussed via PowerPoint. I'll send that out to you guys in the field. Um, thank you all for being here with us this morning. Greatly appreciate it, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.